time to time, we need to be reminded of this subject. Humility. I don't know about you, but lately, that old part of the flesh called pride just wants to well up, and we have to be careful of it, don't we? We fight against it sometimes. Sometimes we don't even realize that we might be walking around with some pride on our shoulder, chip on our shoulder. Lord, what's, what's with this pride that I'm dealing with? And the Holy Spirit has to get our attention, focus it where it needs to be, and help us so that we can come before the Lord with humility. You know what the Scripture says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14? If my people, I mean, that's us, which are called by my name, shall do what? That's the first thing. We're going to come before the Lord. We've got to come before Him humble. You need something from the Lord, you come before Him humbly, right? You come before Him in worship and praise, you come before Him humbly. You see... Satan, Lucifer at the beginning, call him that as well. What was his problem? Pride. My goodness, pride is at the root of so much. And we need to be aware as, as followers of Jesus Christ that just because we give our lives to Jesus, just because we surrender ourselves unto the Lord, that we're never going to deal with pride. So God, help us. Give me humility, true humility, so that I can come before you, Lord, and love you and serve you and receive what I need from you in my time of need, but also to be able to serve one another. We serve in humility. The church needs, I really believe as a whole, a greater, um, a greater sense of humility in their lives. So let's look at the scriptures. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, okay, that's us, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, and here's a list, and I chose the middle one there, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and above all these virtues, Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, Peter writes these words. He speaks to the young men. He says, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, how do you think that's all? That's right here, young and old and everybody, right? Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because... God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Could you use some grace this morning? Lord, I need grace. Lord, may I walk in true humility. Two famous people who thought more of themselves than they should have kind of goes like this. Everybody know the actor named Tom Selleck? Okay. The actor Tom Selleck said, whenever I get full of myself, hopefully that's nobody here, Whenever I get full of myself, I remember that nice couple who approached me with a camera on a street in Honolulu one day, and when I struck a pose for them, the man said, no, no, we want you to take a picture of us. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even know who he was. That would be a big blow, wouldn't it? You're ready to take a pose. and No, here. <laughs> we all know Muhammad Ali. And... Uh, he was, when he was in his prime, and as he was about to take off on an airplane flight, the stewardess reminded him to fasten his seatbelt. He came back brashly and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. The stewardess quickly came back with, Superman don't need no airplane either. So guess what? He fastened his seatbelt. <laughs> okay, what about spiritually speaking when it comes to humility? Let's go to some great preachers of the gospel, leaders of church history, and let's hear what they have to say. Andrew Murray put it this way, Humility is nothing but the disappearance of self in the vision that God is all. Humility is nothing but the disappearance of self in the vision that God is all. Then from George Whitefield, it is good to be humbled. How many want to say it that way? It's good to be humbled, right? 
I am no better than when I brought to a lie at the foot of the cross. It is a certain sign that God intends that soul a greater crown. And then Samuel Rutherford. Humility is a strange flower. It grows best in the winter weather and under storms of affliction. I think it's true. Think about times in your life where you go through the deepest valleys. When you go through time of affliction and persecution and trial. It brings you to a place of humbly coming before the Lord saying, God, I need your help. You know, there was, there's recorded in the uh, <coughs> book of Revelation chapter 3, church called Laodicean Church. They thought it had it all going, going good for them. They had everything they needed. They got puffed up with some pride. The Lord had to reprimand them. Don't you realize that you're wretched, poor, blind, and naked? It causes a lukewarmness of soul. I'm concerned today that, that there are many today who would call themselves, of maybe even a follower of Jesus Christ, that, that they've become a little bit lukewarm because of pride, because of that which is welled up in their heart that, you know, we can do this without God. We, we, we don't say it, but we act like it, don't we? God, I can't do this without you. I don't know how many times I pray, Lord, I can't do this without you. I can't walk this mountaintop or this valley without you, Lord. I need your help. I need your strength. Being a person of humility is a quality that we must all work on in our lives. Can I get an amen to that? That means me. That means you. Clothed. Being clothed with humility is defined as being free from pride. The quality and condition of being meek and modest. That's what it is. Showing submissive respect. Seems to me today that many have lost respect for one another because of pride that wells up in the soul. One of the things we've tried as parents to, over the years to teach our children is to show respect. Show respect for those who have... Uh, have, have authority and leadership in our lives. And so it needs to be true in all of us. It's all about how we perceive ourselves and how we treat other people. Pride, you see, is being the opposite of humility. Pride holds us into bondage. We become a slave to it, and we don't even realize we become a slave to pride and as we mentioned a moment ago, Satan is the author of pride that entered into his heart when he was worshiping around the throne in heaven. Pride is one of the big problems of the world today. Would you agree with me? So let's ask God as we read in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, for forgiveness in this area. Lord, forgive me when I have thought a little bit more of myself than I should. Let us... Walk in our lives to put others first. Let me share with you a few things about, uh, about pride and, 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 or actually about humility. I want to go the opposite. I want to go to pride rather. And let's share a few things about humility. And what does it mean or where do we need to be clothed with humility? The first area is this. Clothed with humility in our judgments. In our decision making. Hold on just a second here. Okay. Your nature is this. Your nature is this. I'm right. How many like to be right? <laughs> is that kind of a good feeling? I knew I was right. I told you so. If you listened to me, you would have known I was right. Early on in our marriage, we figured, we figured out who was right. It wasn't me. <laughs> Oh, we work at it together. It's a joint journey, husband and wife. Sometimes she's right, and maybe a few times I'm right. But uh, you know what? Humility goes a long ways in relationships, doesn't it? In our decision making. But some people are like a steamroller in making decisions. The danger comes when a person becomes insensitive, insensitive to others' opinions, the counsel of other people. Folks, Proverbs says there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors in your life. 
And so it's good. You have another voice, someone else that can share. in your. If you go through life thinking you don't need any help, you're in big trouble. We need to listen to the advice and the counsel of others of wisdom and experience. But yes, we become, and if we're not careful, pride gets into our heart and we become insensitive to other people's opinions and counsel. A person's confidence in their own perceptions of things can go too far. We all perceive things a certain way, but sometimes it goes to an extent that should not be there. Making decisions based upon our own experience and knowledge. Listen, I've done it this way, and my way is the best way. Because I've learned it this way. You know what? Your way isn't always the best way. And there might be other people that have gone through life and experienced it differently. And so, here it is. In our judgments of where we're at and what we should do with our lives, decisions we should make, will you just join with me in being careful about making judgments without, without asking God and coming before Him in humility? There's times, have you ever been there where you say, Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know the answer. How many have been there? I don't know the answer. So in humility, I am willing to ask for help. I'm willing to say, hey, God, I need you in this judgment in my life. Proverbs, let me give you a couple scriptures in Proverbs to help us. Proverbs 11:14. 14. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. And then also in Proverbs, we read this. Where, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I also like what uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, where it talks about leaning not on our own understanding. And that's, that's a big one for me, because sometimes I just rely on my own thoughts, my own understanding of things. And you do that, you know what happens? You start arguing with yourself, and that's just a no-win situation. Have you done that? You're just relying on your own understanding. It gets awfully chaotic in my head. It gets down in my heart. And I'm like, God, I'm trying to do this with my own understanding, and it's not working so well. It could be with your finances. I mean, you know, that gets into difficult territory. Or it could be in a, some purchase that you have to make some relationship that you are in or hope to be in in your life or families. Yeah, it could be a work situation. Sometimes you feel like, Lord, I just need to... And I'm going to give you a word of advice. You ready for that? Be slow to speak and quick to listen. I think that's in the Bible too, isn't it? <laughs> that's a good word of wisdom when it comes to making judgments and decision making. So show humility there, would you? Second thing, another area is the view of yourself. And these kind of touch on each other. We, that three-letter word, your ego. Your ego can get in the way. Your nature that says, well, I'm deserving of this. I've earned my way up the ladder for this. Or I'm old enough for this now. I'm deserving of this. Talking about ego. There are heart issues that begin to show themselves in acts of jealousy and envy if we're not careful. A person's confidence in their own abilities can go too far. Think of an example in the Scriptures. Brother and sister of Moses. Miriam and Aaron. I think we can do a better job than Moses leading these people. They're having their little discussion off in the corner, off in another place. Moses can't hear them, but God hears them. Wow. Some pride welled up. Looking, I can do a better job at that and just kind of going on and on and putting their brother down. You know, God put Moses in a place of authority, in a place of leadership. You know, I have leadership and authority over me. I have to be careful what I say. But here it is. Sometimes we get too puffed up about ourselves and our abilities. And by the way, if you don't know the story of Miriam and Aaron, 
Uh, Miriam came down with leprosy over the whole thing because God heard it. Be careful of those little side conversations that maybe you're saying, and it's you've you got to be careful. You're talking about somebody you shouldn't be, and you're downing them, and you're like, hey, I could do a better job, and I could do this, that, you know, because God hears it all. Moses had to intercede for his sister. Of course, God took the leprosy, but what a lesson to be learned. I think sometimes God has to give us lessons so we realize that, that we need to come before him in humility. Lord, strip away. Would your prayer be with me today? Lord, strip away all the pride. God, just strip it away. Help me to not look at myself more highly than I ought. Because that's what the scripture says in Philippians 2, verses 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, you're better than me. How did that feel? <laughs> you're like, whoa, <laughs> you're better than me. If it's your spouse, you're like, I know. <laughs> no, we know that. Think of others better than yourselves. Each one should not look only on his own interests, but also the interests of others. You know what? When you think of that, you know, that means you might be inconvenienced. You had plans. You had, thought, you had things you were going to do and be, and all of a sudden somebody's in a place of need, and you're like, you know what? They're better than me. I need to look out for their interest over mine. That's the true love that does what? Binds it all together. Hello? Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, goodness, kindness. Binding it together so love says, you know what? It's okay. I can drop everything I'm doing and I can help you in your time of need. That's humility. God is more concerned about the attitude of your heart than your abilities and your talents. Did you hear me? He's more concerned about that attitude of yours. So God create and may I have humility in my heart. Now I want to go to the third area. In your treatment of others. Your nature says, I should be first. Situation turns out the way I want it to. Have you ever tried to work into a situation to make it turn out the way you wanted it to? And you're like, man, that took a lot of work to get there. You know what? We connive, we plan, we orchestrate. I think some of our orchestrating of things in life need to get thrown out the window. Say, God, may I get to the altar and ask for help. God, I, I need you in this moment of my life. Or you could go on the other side of this. It's their turn. I've done my part. Emphasis on I've done my part. Be careful with that as well. May God continue to work in us a life of service as we treat one another with, with humility from our own heart. There's always the danger of acting in selfishness when we get our eyes upon the needs of others and not of ourselves rather, and not those of other people. It's kind of like, if I don't hear about it, and if I don't see it, I'm not responsible for it. Don't go and hide yourself away in that respect. Because God's called us to be a part of each other's lives. When things happen, we want to treat them with love and respect. A person's expectation of what should be for them can go too far. Luke chapter 22 and verse 26 says, But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. Serving others will keep you humble, my friend. Fourthly, another area. Your desire to be accepted by other people. Your nature says, I need you to like and approve of me. As young people, when we're dealing with young people, one of the subjects we talk about is peer pressure. But I just know this. It doesn't end with being a teenager. It, it comes into adult life as well, doesn't it? 
just because it, you know, we focus teenagers, you know, don't be like your friends, don't try to be like them, be copycats and all this. It, adults can fall into the same trap where we want to just be accepted by everybody. You need, an, you need to be liked, you need to, to be approved of, and so you'll just do anything. I've watched people be wishy-washy depending on who they're around at the time. It's like, do you have any, any backbone? <laughs> Is, is, there, is there anything about you that's sure, that's not wishy-washy and back and forth? You know, the Bible says in James, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So God, if, if, if you say who you are, then live it every day. 24-7, be, that's called integrity. A person of integrity is going to live the life the way God's intended for their life to live and it's not going to be wooed back and forth depending on who they're around and what situation they find themselves in. And I know that's a tough place. Sometimes it's a tough battle because we all would love to be liked by everybody. And I found that years ago that doesn't happen when you're living for Jesus. And a person's actions can show a willingness at times, if we're not careful, to compromise our own convictions. Those convictions of yours will be put to the test. How many say they've been put to the test at work? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They've been put to the test sometimes with other family members and friends. Yes, you're going to find that to be true. Cause a person, sometimes because of that, we want to avoid others who think that they may give a wrong impression of what they want to be portrayed as. So they maybe withdraw. That's one negative way to handle it. Another way is for vanity to creep into, in, into an oppression of, uh, of our lives. and it, it alienates us from those who are able to help us to live the Christian life. Nobody wants to be around a vain person, do we? The Bible tells us to avoid selfish ambition and vain glory. Not to be a person like that. How we're accepted by others. Have a status to be popular can go too far. God is concerned once again, and I mentioned it a few moments ago, God is concerned about your character as a follower of Jesus Christ. What kind of person are you truly? E.M. Bounds, who wrote a lot of books on prayer, said it this way, and I quote, Character is what we are. Reputation is what people think we are. And sometimes I believe we've got it backwards. We are concerned more about reputation and we work really hard to get it, but our character down deep inside is not right. It's not Christ-like at all. Romans chapter 12 and verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Think about that for a moment. Be willing to associate with people of low position. I suppose that goes to whatever society we live in at the time. I mean, there's different cultures around the world, right? And that could mean differently for different folks. There was a movie that went out many years ago, The Blind Side. I remember watching The Blind Side. It was a really good movie. And uh, the mom saw this young fella that was really having a rough go of it. He was really having a bad time and things, all the strikes against him. And she took him in to their home and uh, gave him a place to live and fed him. And he needed, he needed better education and challenged him. He would be considered, what I would say, someone of low position, but saw that she could help and felt felt in her heart, i got to do something. I just can't let that go. I can't let him just walk that road. And some of the things that's happened to him is not his fault. Uh, have you ever known somebody? You're like, man, some of that that's going on in their life is not their fault. They've, they, they've had these things happen to them, and their life is being shaped in a negative way, and I want to come along and rescue them and help them. And, and some receive it, and some don't, right? But for those who do, in that story, reached out and helped this young man, and some of you know the story, what happened. He got educated, went off to university and got more education, became a famous football player. Why? Because someone 
was, was willing to associate with someone of a lower position than themselves and made a difference in their life. Do you think that's what Christ wants us to do? Yes, He does. And you know that, that mom, she refaced ridicule from her friends. She faced all kinds of things like, you're trying to help that guy. You're, you know, she was being challenged with where she was in society and her culture. And I just want to challenge you as we think about going out beyond ourselves. You know, one of the things we're tangibly doing is, you know, we're not going to see these children, are we? But we've got the Operation Christmas Child. And we're reaching out to, to children and families that are going to be affected. There's going to be uh, material about Jesus in there, right? And they're all going to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They're going to be able to read it and be a part of that uh, message of hope in their lives. And it's reaching out in a people of lower position than us. People that need a fa Savior. They need to know the Lord. And it's even right here in our own community, my friend. It's all our own community. It's at our back doorsteps. God, help us. Help us, Lord, to not, to not be so filled with pride that we're not willing to associate with somebody on the other side of town, on the other side of the train tracks. We support ministries like uh, Power Company Kids Club down in Pontiac. I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of families there that are hurting. There's violence. There's all kinds of kids that are left to live on their own during the week. And we're supporting that ministry. And we're being an active part and willing to associate in that respect to people in lower position. Jesus was known as one who ate at the homes of sinners. Right? Spent time with them. When he walked to the house of Zacchaeus, people were, were grumbling and couldn't believe what Jesus was doing, going to this man's house. Yeah, he had money and, and, and power and was hated by so many. Yet, spiritually, he was in a place of low position. He needed a Savior. Jesus went to be with the woman at the well and the adulterous woman who, who uh, was, was in the process of going to be stoned he, he ate with sinners because they knew, he knew they needed, they needed salvation. They needed to be saved. Jesus came to do what? Seek and to save the lost. So I tell you this morning, be careful of the pride of appearance. Be careful of the pride of appearance. Samuel was told by the Lord when going to anoint the king of Israel concerning David in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. These words. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So much could be resolved, I think, in our own minds and hearts if we would just look at everybody as Jesus looks at them. Today, we, we live in a world that's filled with lots of labels. We're labeled this. We're labeled that. We're labeled a political party. We're labeled a, a, a denominational. I go to this church. I go to this denomination. Or, you know, I, you know I'm this and I'm that. We just got all kinds of na labels for people. And that's how the, the natural is. We look at people by appearance. But God looks at your heart. And God's looking at your heart right now. Man, I just tell you this. Let's just do this. Just strip yourself of all the labels that people have given you, what you think you are. What you try everybody to see who you are. Because we all do it, right? Anybody here wearing a, wearing a, a, a getup so nobody can see who you are? Right? I think I can tell everybody here, right? But sometimes we try to, we put on a, a costume, if you will. We put on something different so that people can see a different you. To see a different you. But God sees you. He knows your heart. He knows the things you're struggling with. He knows if there's pride that's in your heart that needs to get rooted out. And sometimes we do our best to hold it inside. And I just want you to know this morning that to trust in our own works and our religious activities and coming to church and going through the motions is not going to get you into heaven. You being here today doesn't take care of your sin, your sin problem. 
Because we all have a sin problem. There is no one of us here. That's why Jesus came. Because I have a problem, you have a problem. It's sin. But Jesus came to redeem us, to set us free, so we could sing the song of victory in Jesus. Could you sing that first hymn this morning, knowing it's true in your life, really true? And that He's your Savior forever, not just today, not just tomorrow, but forever? That you've totally and completely says, I'm yours. The other song talked about, I'm yours. That means getting rid of any pride, any arrogance, any vanity, any selfish ambition, vain glory, anything that you want to be appear to somebody else which you really know is not true of who you are because God knows the deepest resources of your heart. He knows every thought that goes through your mind. He knows when you argue with yourself and He knows everything that goes on in that head of yours and that heart of yours. My prayer for all of us in these days that we are living in especially, when emotions run high, when attitudes cannot get on the express train, <laughs> and things can get somewhat out of sorts in our lives, to pull it back, my friend, and say, God, help me. Help me to operate in humility. Whether what I say or whatever I do or whoever I meet at the supermarket, whoever I, I meet on social media. Hello? Wherever it is, God, even in the church, God, help me. Don't you want to be known as a person who is humble? Not stuck up on themselves and their ways and their ideas and thinking they've got it, my way or the highway. I'm right, you're wrong. You know, when the early church got together in the one accord in the upper room and the Holy Spirit fell upon them, you know what being one accord is? It's being humbled with each other. Humbly recognizing together. Would you this morning, we're going to close with prayer in a moment. If they want to come, we're going to, we're going to sing a chorus and then we're going to pray. Listen, would you with me determine in your heart that you're going to be more of a person that shows true humility one for another? Will you do that? I really believe that the church needs to lead the way. Are you with the church needs to lead the way with humility of heart. Oh, God, help us. Jesus humbled himself, was obedient to the cross. Think about it. Jesus was the ultimate example of humility. And you say, I want to be like Jesus then strip away the pride, my friend. Strip away the arrogance. Strip away the, the attitudes, the, the things that grip a hold of your heart and say, no, Lord. And can I say this before you speak and before you post? Check it with humility. Check it with humility. What is the reason? Why? Have you ever said something you wish you hadn't have said? You said, man, that was pretty prideful of me to do that, to say that. Maybe today we just need to ask God to forgive us. God, forgive me, I, I've acted in ways that weren't showing humility. Maybe humility got in the way and you weren't able to serve because, you know, you had your plans. You had your ideas. I'll pray for you. Hope you find some help. Hope you're there to, hope someone can come alongside of you during that time you're going through. Listen, true humility says, I'm going to drop everything and I'm going to help. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do my part. God, give us a servant heart. Would you bow your heads with me? Make an altar right where you're at, Father. We make an altar right now. God, will you work in our lives today? Help us to be true in our, in our hearts with you because, God, you see everything. First of all, if you need Christ as Lord and Savior, you're here today and you realize that, man, I've been walking in my own way. I've been walking in the way that I think seems best, but I've messed it up and I need Jesus to forgive me. I need Him to cleanse me. I need Him to wash my sins away. I need to, I need to allow Him to have the Lordship of my life. In this moment, you can ask Christ into your life. Just say, Jesus, right now. Right now, Lord, I surrender. Everything I am is Yours. Wash me, cleanse me, come into my life. Today, Lord Jesus, I repent. I turn from my sins. 
And I ask you right now to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Wash me and make me new. Make me a new creation in Jesus Christ. For the old is gone and the new has come. Lord, I pray this and I thank you for loving me and forgiving me. Oh, hallelujah. You pray in that prayer. That's, that's the decision you're making. A new life change. A new life direction. Eternity in focus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You need to tell someone what's happening in your life today. Surrendering to Christ. Hallelujah. New creation in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As we're going continually in prayer this morning, I want to pray for all of us. I'm not even asking for a show of hands. You know why? I believe we all need another dose of humility. All of us. Me included. So I want to pray for us. Whatever area it is, you know where it is where maybe that pride has kind of surfaced. Father, I pray that we together will walk in true humility. We first of all humble ourselves before you. You said if we humble ourselves before you, you would lift us up. So Lord, we humbly come to you. May your church, Caro Assembly of God, and churches all around our country, I'm thinking churches all around our country right now, we just need to come in humility to you. We need to seek your face, and we do that right now. Lord, strip away, strip away attitudes right now that aren't right. Strip away those perceptions of people and things that shouldn't be there. God, I... I pray this for all of us in Jesus' name. May we demonstrate the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we love you so. We worship you, Lord. Do that work in our life right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I pray that for us.